My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. I'm planning to do this afternoon is to talk initially about some FDA-approved agents and regimens, and these may be new to you because I specifically chose things that had just been approved and for which data might be useful so that you have heard about them. And then I'm going to talk at the end about a couple investigational antiretroviral strategies. So the first drug that I wanted to talk about is a drug called Bictegravir, and this was FDA approved as a fixed dose combination earlier this month. So if you've never heard of it, don't feel bad. It is a very potent strand transfer inhibitor, so an integrase inhibitor, and its claim to fame include the fact that it's active against first generation integrase resistant isolates, so isolates that are resistant to raltegravir or alvitegravir. It also doesn't require any boosting or have any specific food requirements, and it's dosed once a day. So it is currently available as a fixed dose combination called Bictarvi, and it has 50 milligrams of this Bictegravir along with tenofovir alafenamide and amtricitabine. And I have no idea what the price is, but maybe the person who just walked in the door here can tell us. The two studies that I wanted to mention that were presented at this meeting about this fixed dose combination. One was a randomized switch study from what I think is one of the very commonly used fixed dose combinations containing an integrase inhibitor, which is dolutegravir with 3TC and avacavir. There were over 500 patients who had virologic suppression in this study taking this dolutegravir containing regimen, and they were randomized one to one to either continue their current regimen or to switch to the Bictegravir containing regimen. And the bottom line was that all of the things that were looked at had comparable outcomes, whether it be virologic, adverse events, renal biomarkers, and there was no resistance seen in this small, pretty large study, but very few patients had virologic failure. The other study that I thought was worth noting, even though it's only 24-week results with this combination, was a study in almost 500 women. And as you may be aware, women are often underrepresented in clinical research in general and in HIV research in particular. So the fact that there were 500 women I thought was great. These women were all virologically suppressed, either on a boosted PI or some other integrase inhibitor, and then they were randomized to switch to the Bictegravir-containing regimen or stay on whatever they were on. And the bottom line at 24 weeks was that things looked very, very similar. The Bictegravir appeared to be safe and effective. The study had very new regimen was non-inferior to the current regimen that individuals were on. There weren't any differences in adverse events, which is actually pretty remarkable because usually when you switch to something new, there are more adverse events than when you continue on something. And biomarker trends were similar. The caveat is that it is 24-week data. But given the information that is available that led to this formulation's licensure, I suspect that there won't be surprises, at least over the 48 and 96 week time period, which is all the data that are available on this compound right now. The other compound that is FDA approved, which you may or may not have heard about, is a drug called ubilizumab. And this was actually approved during the week that CROI was held. And it is approved for treatment in combination with other antiretroviral agents for highly experienced people who have multidrug resistance. Fortunately, these patients are increasingly rare, but there occasionally are some. And so I think it might be worth knowing about this compound for that reason. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody that is an attachment inhibitor. And the information presented at CROI was actually about the baseline resistance of this compound. The phase three study actually had only 40 patients in it, so it's the smallest phase three study I've ever heard of. But it did lead to the licensure of this compound, 
And the resistance data was that was presented was that resistance to other drug classes did not affect susceptibility to this compound, which makes sense because the other classes that they looked at were the traditional classes of non of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleosides, and protease inhibitors, as well as integrase inhibitors. And those all work by different mechanisms than this compound. The other FDA-approved drug that I wanted to mention is just tenofovir alafenamide, which I believe I talked about last year when I was here. The quick takes on this are really at the bottom. TAF, in combination with other anti various other antiretrovirals, is safe, effective, with favorable effects on bone mineral density and renal biomarkers. And in a, one of the largest studies, it appeared to be had worse lipid trends in terms of total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides when people were switched off a tenofovir, a TDF, the, our current formulation of tenofovir that's been available for a long time, when they were switched. The most notable, these three, the lower three studies were in adults. They were various drugs, switches, and support what I've said below. The other one at the top was actually quite interesting because currently TAF and TDF have had very little use and very little data in adolescents. This particular study was an open-label study that added TAF to 14 adolescents. Another 14 actually received m but the adolescents at 48 weeks, they appeared to have peak uh, pharmacokinetics that were similar to adults and the drug appeared to be safe when added to their current formulation. And as a result of those preliminary data, there are going to be larger studies in adolescents, which obviously sorely need additional treatment options. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was the Abacavir data that were presented. And I understand that Sharisha Danaretti gave, gave a talk earlier this year, sometime in the past year, about Avacavir. So this may be an issue that you're already aware of. There have been conflicting data about whether Avacavir was associated with increased cardiovascular risk in people with HIV taking it as part of their regimen. And there have been conflicting data for a while, although some increasing data over time supporting this association and in my view, the data that were presented at CROI in four different studies really were very solid with respect to supporting this association. There were two human studies, one mouse model of thrombosis and one in vitro study, all of which supported the association between the use of abacavir and coronary artery risk. The two human studies are described in brief here. One was a Swiss cohort coronary CT angiography study where they took over 400 patients and did coronary calcium, coronary CT scan, angiography CT in them. And after they accounted for multiple confounding factors and the multiple different antiretroviral drugs that the people in this large sub-study were on, they found that only abacavir appeared to be associated with high-risk plaque in these angiograms and with the clinical manifestation of coronary artery disease. The other a human study was a sub-study of a, a prospective study that is randomly switching people who are on abacavir-containing regimens to TAF and lamivudine, keeping the third drug stable. And in the 61 patients in what they called a platelet function sub-study of this prospective study, they demonstrated that switching from an abacavir-containing regimen to a TAF-containing regimen was associated with lower platelet reactivity after the switch to TAF and FTC. This was lasted with certain of the agonists to make the platelets reactive out to at least 48 weeks and started as early as four weeks, depending on which agonist they were talking about. So in my view, the subtotal of this, both observational data as well as randomized clinical trial data showing what might be a mechanism for this, as well as the past data, really raise, in my mind, a very significant concern about the use of abacavir, especially in people who have other coronary risk factors, but possibly in everyone. 
So the last two things that I want to talk about are investigational antiretrovirals, and this just gives a little bit of a peek into the future. And the first one that I want to raise was a study about a compound called MK8591, which is a adenosine analog that is a new drug that it has a new mechanism of action. It's a, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase and translocation inhibitor. So what you may remember is that the current NRTIs that we've been using for the past several decades are chain terminators that result in when reverse transcriptase is copying the RNA to DNA, those inhibitors and the growing chain. This compound acts also at another location earlier in the reverse transcriptase process. It has the potential for oral daily dosing as well as long-acting dosing as an implant. It has a very long half-life, and it is active against NRTI-resistant variants. There's a phase two study underway, but what I wanted to sh mention was just this phase one study in HIV-negative individuals. They use doses as low as 0.25 milligrams, or as high as five milligrams for four to six weeks. The individuals had optional vaginal or rectal biopsies, but there were a limited number, and there's really not decent data from, or de I didn't think from those that report. There were all four drug-related adverse events, all were mild or moderate, and the really striking thing was that the intracellular triphosphate, which is the active moiety, was more than tenfold above that which would be needed to inhibit HIV, and in all of the dosing groups, even the, point, the quarter of a milligram a day, this drug was detectable 30 days after dosing. So the conclusions they made were, and, and which I believe are true, is well tolerated. It has a very long intracellular half-life, well above what's shown to suppress HIV. And I suspect we'll be hearing more about it as some kind of a long-acting drug in combination with other drugs. Lastly, I wanted to just mention the fact that there are a lot of studies underway and a lot of interest in using two drug regimens for treatment of HIV. And in theory, this is to decrease pill burden, although I think that's less of an issue now in our country than it used to be, to decrease side effects and possibly cost. And there was one of the one study that was presented at CROI that's very similar to most of the others that have been done so far, 48-week data in a relatively small number of patients. In this case, it was 145. They were antiretroviral naive, and they were randomized to either receive a dual drug regimen of ritonavir-boosted darunavir or a triple drug regimen with the same protease inhibitor plus tenofovir and 3TC. And bottom line, it looked not inferior. It looked like it was safe. There are many other larger studies that are planned. And so in my view, although there is a growing body of data and there is one such regimen now approved as a fixed dose, that being oral cabotegravir and ropivirine, which may certainly, is currently for the U.S. guidelines, is viewed as an alternative regimen for special situations. And I think that it certainly may be uh, used that way. I feel like there are lots of questions that remain about longer-term outcomes, more diverse populations. How much adherence do you need to this? And how would you salvage it if people didn't do well on it? as well as the impact on immune activation. So I think it's, it's certainly something that's interesting. In my view, it's not quite ready for prime time. And I think the major take-home message is antiretroviral drug development is continuing and hopefully will continue to have evolution that will help all of our patients be successful, which I think, unfortunately, is not the case for everybody these days. And thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions if there's time or not, if there's not.